Hey everybody, I'm back. Welcome back to The Lawyer's Daughter, or welcome to The Lawyer's Daughter if you've never listened before. I am calling this season three, post-conviction edition. I appreciate, I, it sounds so weird, but I actually missed you guys. Can I miss somebody that I can't see, like personally? I don't know. But I'm, I want to make sure everybody knows I do both video and audio. So if you're listening on audio, great. I'm going to try to um, articulate with words what I'm showing on the screen. If you're into watching uh, an old lady, me, talk, then you can watch on video. It's, on, it's at YouTube and it, it might provide you with some sort of entertainment. I don't know. You can definitely check out my pandemic hair because it just keeps getting longer and longer, but, but I got curls to work today. So that's the thing. I haven't done that in a long time. So here I am in my own home, not in Sacramento. I'm in Santa Cruz. We are post-conviction and it, we're not done. I can't explain to you how we're not done, but there are things happening behind the scenes, which I hope to share with you as we go through this next season of the podcast. Things, so I, I used the time away very productively, not only for just sleep, but I, I can't even explain to you how much less I'm crying these days, which is huge. I mean, I think I lived the last week without crying. It doesn't, those, those traumatic moments aren't hitting anymore, which is a huge relief. But what is clear is there's still work to be done. There are things that we can do. And I've been trying to decide where to put my energy just as a human being, because I am going to have to somehow figure out how to earn a living. And yet I don't think I can go back working for Silicon Valley in the way I was before. I just have to do something with meaning. So I'm cooking up some ideas. I'm working on some writing. I'm still writing for Medium, which I think is a cool way. And I, you know, on Medium, you can make like $7 on an article, seven. That's almost a movie, which we can't go to anyway, because we're still in a pandemic. <sighs> yes, although I did eat lunch outside today, like I was in high school, and I got a little tiny mask. I don't get any color, but I have a little tiny mask line. See that little tiny line? Uh, yeah, that's from the sunshine. I actually had sunshine today, so that's good. I was, I've been able to, I, I really want to think about how to do this. I'm calling it season three. That just, just cracks me up because I can freaking make up whatever I do, right? But I, I really want to think about what it is I wanted to do because we won't have a case to follow per se actively, although if you are happy with the journey you're on with me, then you will continue it because this could actually be interesting where I end up going. I have no idea where I'm going to end up going. So this is what I would like to consider the before. It's probably really in the middle, but it kind of feels like the before. And I... Thank you so much for taking the survey. I'm going to share some of those results coming up, but it helped me know where to put my emphasis and if if you all agree with where I want to go. So like I said, this is a journey I'm on. I really love that you're with me. If you don't want to be with me, that's the beauty of a podcast. You'll stop listening. I'll get that feedback through lower listens. At the other hand, if you really like it, please rate and share because I'm, I need to build a little bit bigger audience. I'm close to having an audience that can be monetized. And if you don't know what that means, welcome to my world. Monetization is where is, is something we're going to talk about today, actually. I'm going to dig in with a subject that's been, um, that's grabbed my attention and is aligned with what I think the third season of The Lawyer's Daughter is about. And that's two things. One is this journey of where I end up putting my energy. And if that means I'm starting a company, maybe. If I end up publishing, maybe. Whatever that is, I love having you with me. But I also realized that I needed to put some um, parameters around what it is that I'll talk about in this podcast and hopefully um, encourage you to discuss with me. That's my favorite way to do this is if you send me th things on Twitter or you send me an email. I found a bunch of emails. I'll apologize now. I found a bunch of emails I haven't responded to yet. So I'm trying to get through those, but I actually got an email client now that I think will work well to help me filter through those and get back to people. Uh, so what I, what I, where I believe this podcast lives is at the intersection of law, of victim, victim exp user experience. I keep calling it the victim user experience because my Silicon Valley brain wants to talk about the user experience as a victim. Certainly just lived through that in the last two and a half years, not to mention what happened, you know, 40 years ago. And then this idea of um, really looking at propaganda, because I, I think that that is something that affects everything. So I, I care so much about sexual assault survivors. That's kind of the folks that I'm going to keep loving up 
as I talk about all of this. And I'll be bringing on guests that come from all different walks of life and can talk about their sexual assault experience, but I'm hoping to bring some voices in we haven't heard before or that are, are less likely to be heard, I think is probably a better way to say it. You have to, you have to really work to go hear them because they, they, they exist on the periphery, right? And I, I care about those people on the periphery because that's how it's easy to get lost or not heard or feel just terrible. So as I look at kind of that Venn diagram intersection of all these things, I'm going to try to find content then that fits in there. Along the way, I realize there's some stories based on emails that I've gotten and um, feedback on the survey that you guys like some of the older stories from the old days. Um, I'm going to try to cover a few things from our past, um, the, the Smith family, because that's how you found me, right? Because of my dad and Charlene. So I'll, I'll share some of those stories. I don't know if I'll ever get my mom to be on this podcast, but I'm going to find out how liquor works and maybe get her on Facebook Live tonight as step one. We'll see. And take her up. So it's a good run for the old lady. So that's, that is the big picture. And and I have a content calendar. Look at that. I just grew up and did what I knew to do because I'm a marketing person. I got my content calendar together. And I'm going to try to release pods, I believe, on Mondays and Thursdays is what I'm committing to for myself. So that's two times a week with some predictability. And then I'm going to tell you, and maybe not, or something might, there might be breaking news or something might happen and I want to get to you right away. So I'll always do those. If there's something that I think is timely or important and I have a way that I can get, talk to you guys, I'll do that. Because like I said, to ironically, even though I'm broadcasting to you, I feel like I'm in a discussion with you ongoing. And, um, and I feel like there's ways for you to contact me, both on the lawyer's daughter on Facebook or, of course, on Twitter, which is a much more rollicking, political, short form of communication, which is, uh, I find, kind of fun. It's also, you know, wicked, and we're going to talk about propaganda. It also has its downsides, but I think if we're careful, and I've met so many friends there on Twitter, it feels like a support group for me. So, so join me on Twitter. It's good. Jay Carroll at Jay Carroll. If you don't do Twitter, if you don't do Twitter, don't, don't start. It's okay. You're going to be fine. It's just fine. And if you don't do Facebook, actually kudos to you. I have to use it because it's a way I can, I, it's a, it's a platform I can use that it, there's nothing to replace it. And that's some of the problem we have is that competitively, there's not really anybody out there that's running up against Facebook and offering a competitive differentiator. Maybe that'll change, but we're going to talk about that today too. So coming up next, the next podcast that I'm doing is the interview with Gay Hardwick, which I just put in a can yesterday, and it was a great interview. I love her so much, and I think you're going to be really um, both impressed by her, and she will provoke you to think. And it's probably nothing you haven't thought about before, but it's interesting to hear her first-hand account of the the decisions she had to make and the thinking she had to do as a result of the rape that, again, we think about, but hearing her talk about it. And then it's funny after we were done, and I'll, I'll mention this, I'll mention it now because I, I won't be in the interview itself, but after we were done, and this has come out on Thursday, after we were done, she was really worried that she had gone too far. And I said, actually, I don't think you did. And I think coming from someone like you who is so thoughtful and um, one thing about Gay is she's very, um, she's very purposeful in the steps that she takes forward. There's a lot of intention in what she does. So to hear her speak about the thing that's controversial, and I don't want to give it away, no spoilers, but to hear her think about the thing that's controversial is so from her heart and soul and the pain of the moment that even if you don't agree with what, how she decided to handle things, you will absolutely, I believe, have compassion and empathy for her position. And I, and I reassured Gay, I said that, I, as far as I know, my followers can handle that. That's, that's really why people follow me, I believe, is that you guys like to think about things. You want me to question, I want, you want me to push you, I want you to push me. I enjoy conversation, I enjoy debate, and secretly I'm an outstanding collaborator and I crave collaboration. My poor roommate, Sandra, I, I'm so extroverted that if she goes to the kitchen, I'm in the kitchen. And I told her, you're going to need to tell me to go away if I'm bugging you, because as soon as somebody's going to be active and talking, I'm going to be there. So with that, I'm going to try some new things. I'm supposed to have a green screen. It's not coming for till 19, I don't know, 20, 
27 at this rate, the post service and the ow, ow, ow. Sorry, this is Lulu who thinks I'm a scratchy post. Sorry, that really hurt. Um, <laughs> Sandra just said, did the cats ever interrupt the podcast? Yes, the cats do interrupt the podcast. This kitty's going to get put down now. This is my old kitty and she's pretty old and I know she's in pain most of the time. So as I am now in pain. Anyway, the, the point is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try some new tricks. I've ordered a green screen. It's not here. It's not going to be here forever. So the trick I'm going to do today is going to be kind of crappy from a visual standpoint in terms of me because I have created a virtual background that are my slides because I want to talk to you about um, the movie Cuties. So just know it's not going to be perfect today. It'll get better over time. I'm trying to get some new tools. I'm going to look into a new editing software down kitty down kitty <laughs> look into some new editing software that might also help me but in the meantime uh let's take a stab at what we're going to do today and again always discuss it with me feel free to give me a shout out a comment whatever because i'd like to hear feedback and and i can be highly directed and pointed in other directions so that's that's that so I will start with this. This is interesting. I, the reason I wanted to talk about cuties, and I'm looking right now, I'm going to go to my new fangled background, which is um, pretty cool. Uh, the way this works is that um, Zoom has allowed us to go in to, I should, I thought that I had this ready, sorry, has allowed us to go into their virtual backgrounds. And then as part of that background, why can I not find what I'm looking for right now? As part of that background, you can show slides, which I really, really love. Okay, this is irritating me because it's, it should be right here. I just did these slides. Um, where is it? Why isn't it saving? File, save a copy. It's in the folder. It's right there. I was so ready. I'm going to actually pause because I'm, I'm kind of embarrassed. Okay, I'm back. I don't know where the slides were. That took me much longer than I thought. All right, so I wanted to talk about the movie cuties and i wanted to talk about it because for all of us that care a ton about sexual assault children the safety of children um all of that I, I i thought it was an interesting case study that goes with a little bit of a kick i'm on right now which is around the movie the social dilemma so let's just go through this a little bit slowly because there's been a ton of activity on social media about this and I think it's worth the closer look and, and it behooves all of us to, to really understand what was happening here because honestly, what was happening with, the, what is happening with this movie in particular is it's actually making the case that we care about, which is the sexualization of children is a nefarious, um, awful part of our culture. And it's not just in America, it's in other parts of our culture, but we know it came, it started with the juicy t-shirts for 13 year olds and the horrible things that are even on baby t-shirts. You know, just this idea of sexualizing, honestly, I'm kind of of the don't sexualize anybody, but at least not until you're, cha you're able to uh, be an owner operated sexualizer. Like you can decide, I can decide how many buttons I wanna have open, right? I can decide how I wanna wear my hair. At the point at which you have your own ability to decide how you want to manage your own image that's about the time that sexualization can be that is fair like that's fair all right i can buy it but when we're talking about children who should just be children and honestly i'm of the opinion we shouldn't even be focusing on gender because that just messes people up too we don't have to focus on gender we can focus on then how to make better humans and and that's I'm in California, what do you want from me? This is where I, I'm like, gender to me starts to become kind of extra at a, when you're talking about kids because it just puts them into roles that they don't necessarily want or need. Follow their lead and you're gonna follow their natural curiosity and interest and then that's just healthy and good and yummy and wonderful. Okay, there's the Jen Carroll politics part. I'll be quiet now. But as we go back to cuties, what I noticed happening before I even knew anything about the movie is that there was just vitriol going on, especially on Facebook. And, and I'm going to encourage you to watch The Social Dilemma and you'll discover that Facebook is quite possibly the worst place to get any sort of um, fact-based information. So I'll conclude with this, but I want to start out with this too, which is if you can watch The Social Dilemma, and even if you can't, 
there's a website you can visit. But the, the idea is start paying attention to your Facebook because as you start to look at it with a critical eye, you will realize that a lot of what gets pushed on Facebook at us, even by us, at us, is stuff that is not based in fact. It is the perpetuation and the momentum that's gained by uh, um, people's opinions and assumptions and what I call the Stephen Colbert truthiness as opposed to truth. And if you remember back in 2005, Stephen Colbert came out with Colbert Nation. Very clever, Comedy Central came after The Daily Show. I used to love, that used to be my lunch. I worked from home and I would go out and for 40 minutes, minus all the commercials and everything, it's about 40 minute lunch, I could watch The Daily Show and The Colbert Report. But on the very first day, and if you want to Google this, it's completely worth it to go watch this again. Stephen Colbert did this segment called The Word. I think it was called The Word. And what he would do is read a script, but the cynical truth would appear in print beside him. The thing that was like, yeah, you're full of crap. Here's what's really true. So it was a nice juxtaposition because it showed that what you, what you say and hear is not necessarily what's true. So that's what he did when he did his truthiness. First, 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 first ever word is about truthiness. And the way truthiness is defined, and it's actually now a word in the dictionary, it's so funny because it's not a word, but it is, it is when you believe something in your heart, not in your brain. Meaning that you could say it is 68 degrees outside. That's a brain thing, it's just true. It is what it is outside. The temperature just is what it is. But in the world of truthiness, you'd say, yeah, it feels like 75 though. I'm feeling like it's based on my gut, based on my what I feel inside, it feels like 75 outside. That's a good example of truthiness. It's kind of true because it's about temperature, but it's not at all true because it's not true. It's just not true. It's not 75 out, it's 68 degrees outside. So. Go have fun and watch the old um, Colbert video on truthiness. Totally, totally worth it. So that's, so that, okay, how do we get this? So we're going to talk about cuties because what I saw first was just people losing it over this movie. And I thought that's so interesting. And, and if you're on video, you can see that the, the poster for the movie in French, because the movie came out of France, is, and I'm not going to say this right, but I think it's mignon, uh, you know, the little, little cuties that's the word cuties but it is the cover of this movie in france was it shows little girls in regular play clothes wearing grown-up clothes over the top like little girls in their um target togs this the girl animals that we uh have them wear when they're 10 and 11 because they can be adorable but also uh feel so somewhat stylish in this photograph you see that they have uh thong underwear pulled up over the outside of their clothes and bras over the outside of their clothes, which was the right the movie maker's point, which is we advance these girls too early. We grow them up too soon. They think they need bras when they're in when they're 10 years old. They think they should be wearing thongs because freaking so justice, the store sells them to them. It was another big store for kids um, that was Katie what was it called? There was Justice in another one, and Katie loved shopping there, and I'd be like, no, you cannot wear some of these clothes. These are awful. So that's the, that is the movie maker's point, which is that we sexualize young girls way too early. And the imagery used was, was so different than what happened and caused the outroar, uproar in the, uh, in the U.S. So, if you look at the next slide, which I'm going to show, and what I'll tell folks at, at home that are just listening is that there's a so the, the controversy started getting car, uh, covered in the press. USA Today did a series of articles about it. This guy Brian Truitt really went in on it because he found it I think fascinating and it was it was important to understand what was really going on here because honestly Netflix got spanked and he explains that the, the, the controversial Netflix film became a combatant in our cultural war because of imagery. And I'm gonna show you that imagery in a minute. And it is a Netflix, I can't even call it a gaffe. It is a, as they would say in the UK, a complete cock up. I mean, it just unbelievable what the morons in the marketing department at Netflix did. But in this case, when you first look at cuties, if you, when the movie 
the thing you should know about the movie, and it unfortunately got marketed like it was a dance movie, like the movies we're used to where it's cheerleaders dancing and that sort of thing. And it's usually older girls, typically 17 and 18 year olds. In this case, these girls are younger, they're junior high girls. And so what was really clear and didn't come through with the movie is that this movie is for grownups, it's not for kids. And unfortunately, I think a lot of people are out there in a world that believes that movies, okay, we have another cat problem, um, that movies that, are, that have children on them, they show children that those are for kids. No, this movie's not for kids, absolutely not for kids. I'd like to also say this movie's not for pedophiles, but then rarely is any content produced for them. So I'm not really gonna worry about that, although I know that's what made people lose it. Can we just accept that pedophiles want, <clears throat> excuse me, if pedophiles want to find content, they'll find content. So I, I need you to kind of be okay with that. Not that I think it's a good thing. It's a bad thing. I'm just saying this isn't content made for pedophiles. That's really important because at some point we have to have some content that's made to make a point. And that was what the movie maker was trying to do. So it's also was created to tell the story of sexualization. And that is her whole point. I'm going to read you a little bit about what she said about that and why it's so important to her and, and why sometimes we need to not judge things until we actually go learn about them. That is such a simple thing, but we've lost that. And, and the social dilemma, the movie that I'm talking, the other movie I'm talking about, the documentary, is a good example of why we've lost some of that ability to look at other things. So let's, so here's the deal. Netflix packaged this thing, and I'll show you what that looks like in a second. They responded to the criticism in a, in a statement to USA Today and other, other media outlets, because Netflix basically got just so crushed. They said, Cuties is a social commentary against the sexualization of young children. It is an award-winning winning film. It won at Sundance. Um, just, you know, and I don't know if it's been to Khan yet, but it won at Sundance. And it's a powerful story about the pressure young girls face on social media and from society um, that we'd encourage anyone who cares to, about these important issues to watch the movie. So yeah, I'm asking you to hold out the thought that you might be willing to watch this movie because I think that it could help us all have a common language to deal with some of these themes. But I'm going to turn over here really quick because it's on my other screen and talk to you just for a second about what the movie maker was trying to do. And I cannot say her name. It's a French name and it's a beautiful name, I am sure. But let me just tell you about this. Okay, so Cuties was always supposed to be a provocative movie. It was very personal for the director. She Here's her quote. I put my heart into this film. It's actually my personal story, as well as the story of many children who have to navigate between a liberal Western culture and a conservative culture at home. So let's just stop there for a second. That's classic, right? We see this all the time, this struggle that where, where a family is trying to really stick to their family values. And Y'all know, because you don't want your girls on Instagram, because that becomes the, like, who can take the cutest selfie? And if you've never heard this conversation of girls, they would sit in the back of my car as I was driving them to art class or whatever, when in the very early years of first getting a phone, and they would take selfies, Katie and her friends, and I swear to God, they'd take a million of them, and then they'd sit there looking at them, deciding which one was the one to post. And I don't mean looking, let's just say agonizing over what they needed to post. And then finally, there would come the courage to post it, and these are very, very uh, low-key pictures. I mean, they're just selfies, like smiling kind of selfies. Nothing complicated about them at all. But if that post didn't get enough likes in the time frame that the, the kids decided was the time frame they needed, they would be destroyed. Katie would be depressed. Katie would take it down and say, no, I can't have that up there. Not enough people liked it. Mom, it's not a good picture. And I'd be like, I, oh my God, how am I going to fight this? And, and it led to big discussions in our family about that's not how you should be judged. And honestly, your social media presence is like the least important thing in the world. I'm saying that to a preteen who absolutely believes it's the most important thing in, the, in this world. So you can imagine the, the juxtaposition of a very conservative family where you cover yourself, you, you limit your exposure, your sexuality as a private thing, and then being thrown into our Western culture where we are disgusting. I mean, we, we really do push the limit and we think nothing of, we sexualize a hamburger, guys. I, I, you know, I think of that damn Carl's Jr. 
commercial, which I haven't seen in a while. Thank God I don't watch a lot of commercials, but then I'm not the target, right? But just the way that stupid Carl's Jr. commercial where that woman is eating a hamburger and the ketchup's, I mean, it's just disgusting in terms of the sexualization of a hamburger because that's how you're going to differentiate hamburgers. They got nothing else. They're all just a round thing of meat on a bun. So you got to have a way to differentiate. So they pick, let's use sex because sex sells. So this is her dilemma. This is what she, and she is of Senegalese descent. So she came from Senegal and, and then ended up in France, which is considered a West, progressive Western culture, right? The movie follows Amy, um, who apparently does a great job as the little actress, and a young Senegalese, uh, who is a young Senegalese Muslim girl living in France who dreams of joining her friend's modern dance troupe. What little girl doesn't, right? That's like a common thing. If you're into dancing, you see these girls having fun, that sounds like the thing you want to do. It's a fantasy that clashes with her family's traditional values. The, the director says, I wrote this film after I spent a year and a half interviewing pre-adolescent girls, trying to understand their notion of what femininity was and how social media was affecting this idea. The main message of the film is that these young girls should have the time to be children. Huh, that's where I started, right? My God, these kids need time to be kids, to enjoy their childhood and to have the same time to choose who they want to be and when they are adults. And it's interesting, as I'm going to, again, encourage you to watch The Social Dilemma, you're going to find that this idea of when to be an adult is actually lengthening out. Kids don't want to get their driver's license. What the hell is wrong with them? That I lived for that damn driver's license at 15 and a half. I was at the DMV getting my permit. I was good to go. I wanted to drive. Today, kids don't want to go get their driver's license. I can't believe how many kids don't have them. What is wrong with you kids, by the way? What is wrong with you? That is the biggest piece of freedom you could ever have. That's all I saw it as is like pure freedom. The other thing they said is kids aren't dating like they used to which is interesting. I'm talking about dating, I'm not talking about banging, I'm talking about dating. And they don't have the same level of social relationships that we all did. And I'm saying we, if you're not Gen Z, I guess is really it. Uh, I, I, and, and the millennials are interesting to look at because I know some of these changes started to happen with them. But the Gen Z, which are the kids born since 1998, I believe, are the ones who grew up with technology in their lives all the time. And so they're used to pausing things. They're used to being able to access information as they want it instead of the old analog way like we did. If you remember, we used to wait for the TV show to come on and then it would give you a teaser and then it would be commercials, which is when you could go like, go get the ice cream because you didn't get it before the show. I don't know why you came running in to turn on the show. And then, because this is all analog guys, you couldn't drop into your streaming and you couldn't pause it. That was huge because that caused a rush on bathrooms during commercials. Who's going to the bathroom during which commercial? And in our house, it also caused the inevitable, I said saved because we had one really good chair. And I don't know if any of you guys can relate to this, but we had really one really good chair, which older sister Jen typically got because I was the strategist and I knew how to get that chair ahead of time. But if you, the rule was, and I don't even know how this rule developed, but it, well, the rule was if you said saved, if you didn't say saved, somebody could steal your chair. And so you had to get up and say saved. Sorry, I know I'm digressing, but this is the analog days. So you had to wait till the commercials. So the commercial, so they'd ha always have the shows would always open with the teaser. Then it would do the credits and it would go to commercial at the top of the show and you go get your food or whatever you need to get. Go to the bathroom, make sure you said save. Then you come back and you'd watch that show and you couldn't, if you missed part of it, it was gone. And I know that's a hard concept for some younger people to understand, but it was just gone. So you can imagine Gen Z who lives in this world where things can be paused and you can drift in and out of things at, as, as your attention span demands. And the part that it bums me out is it starts to make viewing an isolation, a, a, an act of isolation. In fact, Katie is adamant at her home. She doesn't want a television. And I said, but then how, do, how are we going to watch a movie together? It like solely baffles me. I, go, I, I don't know how we're going to watch a movie together. How do we watch like something that we want to talk about? Because her growing up, I don't think she ever watched a movie all the way through, anything all the way through. I would pause it and then I would explain what was going on or I'd give her a lesson. That poor child, I don't think she ever watched a show all the way through when we were watching TV together. So I was always stopping to explain stuff or have her understand why what she was watching was important or different or interesting. 
But now if you think about it, she doesn't want a TV in her house because she doesn't believe in TV, except here's the thing. She walks around the house all day long with her YouTube streaming. She'll stream hoarders while she's cleaning. It's actually made her a better housekeeper, I have to say, but she'll, she streamed Criminal Minds. She, that's what she's doing, but it's an alone activity until she bursts into the bedroom telling me, you have to see this person on hoarders or <laughs> my favorite mom. I just need to tell you, this guy is 57 and his dad's still paying his rent. I just want to assure you at 57, you won't still be paying my rent, which of course I had to say, um, I hope that that happens way before you're 57. Please let me get done paying your rent now, but we'll get there. We'll get there. Anyway, kids, so the point is Gen Z is, is not growing, it's not maturing in a way that appears to be what I'll say is regular, not normal, but I'll say regular and healthy for them. Okay, so that's what's important here because we're talking about in cuties, she's, this woman was looking at how do girls develop and we're shoving the stuff on them at a young age and then they don't want to go any further because it's all too much or they get humiliated in high school or they're sexually assaulted or sexually abused or sexually maligned, all kinds of things because we shove sexuality on these kids so early. That's what this woman is saying. We want to let these kids develop their own sense of self, of sin, sense of self despite what social media dictates in our society. So. Um, and it's interesting, it says here, the, the woman who wrote this has mixed feelings about the role of social media in the lives of young people. And she goes on to say it affects us all. There is a good side to it. It brings us information and beautiful images and lets us meet more people. But there's a harmful side where I find we have a new way of looking at love. Love and self-esteem are constructed through likes and followers. What happens is young girls see images of women being objectified and the more the woman becomes an object, take this in guys because this is right where we live, the more the woman becomes an object, the more followers and likes she has. So you know this is true. The more you go, oh my god, what a great ass. What great legs. Look at her teeth, her smile. None of these things are important. They're not the person at all, but that's what gets the likes, right? And so what, what happens is that when young girls see images of women being objectified, the more the woman becomes an object, the more followers she has, they see that as a role model and try to imitate these women, but they're not old enough to know what they're doing. This is so, such, so, so good, such a, such a valid point. And we'll talk about why in a couple minutes, but this idea of we want to really protect these kids and not foist the responsibility of sexuality on them too early. They don't know what to do with it. I can tell you, it, I have my use case of one, which is my daughter, but I thought she was doing pretty well. And I didn't learn until much later how she was, that the game was to get, I don't know if I'm allowed to talk about this. Okay, I'll share a little bit about this. I just realized it's kind of her story. Um, let's just say that she was objectified by her friends and the goal was naked pictures of my daughter to be published on social media. That was the game. That's probably enough. But that, that, I didn't know that was happening. I didn't know that was happening. And when I found out, it was this spring when I was sheltering in place with her. It was a very emotional um, night when she shared that with me. I was stunned. Just, you want to talk about feeling like a piece of crap that you didn't protect your kid because you didn't know what was going on and you had no idea that's what was making her insane. Yeah, felt all of that. It, it was rough. That, and so there's my daughter with her own sexual assault stories. As hard as I tried to protect her, didn't do it because I can't protect her from all the things. So instead we talk about what to do next and I introduce her to Chris Pedretti. <laughs> so there's my secret. Um, the last thing that the director says that I think is really interesting is she said, I actually hope that those who haven't seen it will see it. I can't wait to see the reaction. Hopefully they will understand that we're on the same side of this battle. If we join forces, we could make a big change in this world that hypersexualizes children. Okay, so that's, that is what this director's goal was. But here's what Netflix did. Netflix went full American and took one scene from where they have their dance competition. And as I understand the movie, and I haven't watched it yet, I will be watching it um, this weekend. But they took what is no, what is common in America to see like um, a cheerleader dance scene, except these are little girls. These are not even teenagers. These are little girls. And Netflix 
used that information to promote the movie. Not only that, but the copy they wrote was terrible. Amy, age 11, becomes fascinated with a twerking dance crew. Come on, Netflix. Seriously? That's what she became fascinated with? She became fascinated with the power these girls had from doing the dancing. That's really what became fascinating. That's what fascinates all the kids, this idea they suddenly have power. We have no way for them to have agency these days. We've taken away all the ways the kids can feel effective, but they can feel effective on social media. The rest of the Netflix description says, hoping to join them, um, Amy, the 11-year-old, starts to exploit her femininity, defying her family's traditions. Okay, that's a pretty crappy write-up of this movie. And that, and this, it was these images and this description that sent people over the edge because they thought, what is Netflix doing? I can't believe they're promoting child porn. Interestingly enough, Matthew Cherry, who wrote the book and then did the movie, um, uh, what the heck is it? It's hair, it's the hair book, Hair Love. He is a black author and a black movie maker who made the book Hair Love because there's just not enough positive support for the different hairstyles of women of color and his story is amazing and if you don't know matthew cherry's story go look at it because it's just a great story of somebody following their passion doing something to help his child his beautiful daughter and it turned into just um an amazing amazing good fortune for him as it got picked up and turned into a movie well he said it's one of the things he struggled with and he's he went on twitter and said this is why directors should have a say in the marketing which i did not know they did not have a say Honestly, I can't imagine, of all the years I've done marketing, I still keep in touch with the engineers. They don't just throw it over the transom and let me do what I want with it. It's aligned with, my, with the, their vision. I've always worked to market aligned with their vision. So I think this is stunning to me. Anyway, he said studios always push back on directors being involved in the marketing, but that makes no sense since the directors aren't even consulted on the marketing materials for their own movies. Um, and then the the, the sad, saddest part is that the Cuties director got received death threats, death, death, death threats after Netflix posted this god awful poster. I mean, they just they so undermined her and her message, and it's stunning to me how effective they were at at just cocking this up. So here we are. I'm gonna. I, this is. It's pretty cool because um, uh, now. So let me. Do, okay. So Netflix changed the imagery, right? We went back to the good, wholesome images. This is a little 11 year old. She does have a phone. Her parents probably acquiesced because they were very conservative. But what are you gonna do when your kid doesn't have a phone? And half of us get the phone for for safety reasons. That's always a good reason. So here we are with Netflix finally changing everything. And look at how they changed the description. 11 year old Amy starts to rebel against her conservative family's traditions when she becomes fascinated with a free spirited dance crew. Now, isn't that much more to the point? Isn't that such a better write up? And Netflix, you owe this lady so much besides just an apology. The CEO of Netflix did call her. They did apologize, but it's interesting. Okay, I'm going to, I, I want to, um, so I'm going to, I'm going to turn things a little bit because this is fascinating. And what, if you are listening right now, what you can't see is I've just popped up a slide that's about Murphy Brown. And the reason I want to share this with you, because I want to read something else to you, that is written by a man who I deeply respect. He was a, um, he's not a disc jockey, he's like a radio guy, but in California, like I think a lot of major metropo metropolitan areas, we had a radio station called KGO. KGO was community. I don't even know, I, I, I still miss it so much. It was everything for so many of us in the 80s and the 90s and even a little bit into the 2000s until radio ownership started flipping around. But this station absolutely came, was grassroots San Francisco. It, yes, it had liberal people, but it had conservative people too. It even had a pedophile, if you can believe it. Bernie Ward used to work on that station. And for a while, Bernie Ward covered the Oakland Hills fire and I was scared to death for him. And then I found out he was a pedo and I was so grossed out. I think everybody at KGO was pretty grossed out. But we, so, but KGO, they had a guy named Dwayne Jarrett who committed suicide. Dwayne always reminded me of my dad. And I really, he really, I learned a lot from his suicide about the guilt 
men feel when they're in their late 40s and they realize they've made a mistake that could bring their family shame and that men are really at risk if they hit depression at that age because they think it's better to die than to go forward. They want to protect their families. Anyway, we, we lost, we had Pete Wilson. He came from the television channel here and then he, uh, he, he had to go have, I believe it was back or hip surgery and he didn't make it through the surgery. We were devastated. And when I talk about community, that's when you know these people, like you know them. We were able to learn about them in their lives. And so Gil Gross is one of those people. And Gil jumped on the cooties, the cuties, not cooties. Gil might have cooties, I, I don't know. But he jumped on the cuties issue a couple days ago. And I thought what he wrote was so interesting. And it's gonna tie back to Murphy Brown, trust me, I'm gonna get you back there. So here's what Gil had to say. The cuties controversy is so typical of how we debate things these days, which pretty much, which is pretty much that no one knows what the hell they are talking about. Okay, sit with that right there, because the thing is, all of us, including me, will jump into discussions and have an opinion without going to read the article, take the time to understand the headline, understand if the headline's actually um, pointing out the problem with the issue or raising or raising the issue. It's hard to know, especially when we're going fast, and that's what a news feed's designed to do, to get you going, get you moving. That's why I'm gonna have you watch The Social Dilemma. Okay, so just know that that's the first thing. Pretty much nobody knows what the hell they're talking about. First, to be clear, even Gil has not seen the film. Even I have not seen the film. There we go, already in trouble, right? I gotta say, I'm already in trouble because I haven't seen the film. Second, to be clear, neither have the vast majority of the people attacking it. Right now, if I could do an online poll, I'd ask you how many have you seen it? Because I'd be interested to know if you've seen it yet. The film itself is actually against the sexualization of children, just what we've discussed, meaning the female director and the film's critics are seemingly on the same side. That's true. The controversy comes from Netflix using an image of a scene in which the kids are sexualized, for which they are booed and derided in the film, which is important. When when the scenes happen, it's from my understanding, and I can't wait to watch it, but it's... It, it's going to leave you feeling sick, which is what she wanted to do, which is why you watch a movie because you need, you want to take that journey with the director, right? You watch a movie to be moved, to be educated, to have feelings, whatever that is. Well, one of the things she was going for is that you should feel pretty sick about parts of it. Um, okay, it was a really dumb move by Netflix and does deserve condemnation. Whether the film actually might appeal to the very people it criticizes is a good question, and it would be an interesting debate, debate among those who have seen it, which is not at all what is happening. In attacking the film, Ted Cruz described scenes that do not even exist in the movie. Well, there's another thing, is that politicians will use these things as a soapbox, and they're doing it to manipulate us. This is why we have to do our own fact-finding, and we shouldn't retweet crap or promote crap or share crap until we've done our own fact-finding. Anyway, I only comment on this because it reminds me of something sadly similar, and here's the story. And if you don't know the story of Murphy Brown and Dan Quayle, pay attention, because Dan Quayle was our vice president, the vice president of our country. Years ago, ages ago, he says, it was ages ago. It was, it was ages ago. In fact, hang on one second. I'm just going to look at this article. Uh, my 1992. Okay. It's not the dark ages, people. It was just ages ago. I was, you know, uh, God dang, I was 30. I was right in the, I was right in the Murphy Brown age, which was really interesting. Ages ago, then Vice President Dan Quayle attacked the TV show Murphy Brown when Murphy decided to have a baby out of wedlock. You didn't know that? Yes, she did. The show's creator, Diane English, attacked Quayle even though she only knew one line about her show and never read the speech, which surprisingly for all the headlines it made was only re reprinted in an obscure periodical subscribed to by libraries called Vital Speeches. Libraries are a place with books and Vital Speeches was the journal it was in. Okay, really funny. I mean, it's just amazing how much our world has changed. The f full speech was, all in all, quite thoughtful for the time. And uh, I think, here it goes, I think it had to do with poverty. In fact, Quayle opposed other conservatives' demand that new mothers be almost instantly put back to work, included in Bill Clinton's welfare reform package, because he believed mothers should be encouraged to care for their babies. English didn't know any of this because she never read Quayle's speech. 
Okay, note that she never went back and read the whole speech. For his part, Quill admitted to me he never actually saw the Murphy Brown episode in question. Uh, so yeah, you couldn't have because if you didn't see the broadcast, there was no way to go stream it later. At least today we can go fact check, which is really nice. But back then, eh, he didn't watch Murphy Brown. He missed it. We didn't even have TiVo people. We had VCRs. I don't want to tell you how weird that was, but it was something. It was something. You could at least watch it on tape. When I told him Murphy wanted to get married, but her boyfriend ran out on her, he was perplexed. So now we're getting to why Murphy had a baby as a single woman, right? She had the baby daddy. She wanted to get married, but he didn't want to. When I told him she decided to have the baby rather than have an abortion, he was befuddled. When I told him the villain of the, sh villain of the show was the liberal boyfriend who ran out to rejoin the Peace Corps, and the hero of the piece, and it's true, was the right-wing talk show host she once dated, and it was played wonderfully by Jay Thomas, and if you don't know Jay Thomas, go look up his work. He's a great actor. But he played the hothead right wing guy who, um, you know, it's kind of sexy because they didn't agree all the time. So it created some heat between them. Jay Thomas's character wanted to marry, offered to marry Murphy. And he was baffled as to how this debate went on so long. Dan Quayle was baffled to how this debate had gone on so long without anybody telling him any of this. Well, that's what his staff is for, but nobody told him. And in this case, everybody was so caught up in the vitriol, they forgot to go back and pay attention to what the real storylines were. But Dan Quayle was saying, hey, let's ease up on new moms. They don't need to go back to work right away. And on the case of the show, which by the way, was a fictional character, um, she wanted to be get married. She wanted to. It didn't work out. And even another guy said, let's try this. But she knew, no, that wasn't a good recipe for success. Okay. So Gil wraps up with like, so here we are again. We're back to nobody's really going to look at the full story. And that is what brings me back to Murphy Brown, because it's funny that Murphy Brown this controversy, and this is the New York Times that I'm showing on the screen. It's the New York Times, Thursday, May 21st, 1992, which, by the way, is like right after Mother's Day. You have Dan Quayle saying, this was the word he said, it doesn't help matters when primetime TV has Murphy Brown mocking the importance of fathers by burying a child and calling it just another lifestyle choice. That's not what she did, by the way. She didn't call it another lifestyle choice. It's just kind of where she was. And I think anybody that's a woman knows that's just kind of where you are. Um, this thing from the paper is hilarious because it's the front page of the damn paper. And if you look at the rest of the newspaper, it's like there's so much going on. And yet here we are talking about a fictional character who is being um, assaulted by the vice president. And, and, and that's the best part is that the, the vice president hadn't even actually seen the sitcom. So it's the same story, it's 1992, it's 2020, and we're doing the same things. Which brings me to uh, my point. And let's get to the point, shall we? Because I'll wrap this up. The point is, um, we used to say this all the time when we were kids, I mean, our parents told, taught us this all the time. Don't judge a book by its cover. They taught that to us because the point was, until you go look deeper than the outside, if you only are looking at the outside, you're never gonna know what's on the inside. And that, it's, it's such a simple, simple little, um, what are these even called, uh, colloquialisms? It's, it's such a simple idea. And it has to do with all kinds of things, from skin color to someone with an opinion you disagree with. Like, seek to understand, right? That's the key. So, let's it's time we all get woke. Because we'll talk about this. It, this is going to come up again as we move forward in, in with the podcast. But this idea of what's going on with, propaganda with what is trust, trust, trustworthy and what is um, trustiness. We're going to start to talk about those things. And so I think the idea of watching The Social Dilemma, if you have Netflix, it is on Netflix, but if you can't watch it, you can go to thesocialdilemma.com. If you, if, you if you don't have Netflix and you want to learn more about it, it's a good website and it starts to talk about some of the very meta ideas that they were talking about. And they're trying to drive it down to actionable content. So that happens a lot in marketing as we create um, messages and we create content that gets you excited about it, but unless it's actionable, it's not really useful. And so I, I think that there's, um, we always call thought leadership the stuff that wasn't particularly actionable, but could get you thinking differently. And then there is the stuff that is actionable 
and the socialdilemma.com website has some stuff there. I need to spend more time on it because I got really fired up about the show. And I'll tell you what, the show is not everything. It's not going to explain everything, and it is one point of view. But what it really does is it provides us with a common language to have a discussion about what's going on. And that's the value to me of the show, is that suddenly we're all talking about the same thing. And again, we can debate whether it makes sense or not or what, what resonates for us. But at least we're able to talk about it in the same context. And then when we're on social media, and if you can start to get woke about this, it matters, post, share, or retweet after you've vetted the content. And this came up the other day on Twitter, I think it was um, maybe Monday night. One night this week, the story started to break about the women who had had gynecological procedures down in Georgia that they hadn't given their consent to. And I saw it on Twitter and I thought, oh my God, this is so awful. I, I, is this real? So before I retweeted it, because that's the kind of thing I care a lot about, like don't be assaulting women. It's, it's the worst kind of sexual assault. I mean, it's actually, it's creepy. We all know, I don't even have to explain it. Y'all know it's creepy. But before I retweeted it, I went and verified it as much as I could against other sources. I felt confident after verifying it that there were enough other important people saying the same thing that this was worthy of a retweet, even though I knew it was incredibly um, controversial and gross. Then the next day, I got up the next morning, and in fact, a couple of us talked about it on Twitter. We're like, are, are you sure? And I'm like, well, I'm, I'm going to wait for tomorrow because I think this will explode tomorrow or it won't. Well, it exploded. It exploded, and now we have a lot of people coming forward, and we're getting the information to help us understand, is this just a rogue doctor? Is, is there something much more nefarious going on? I don't know, but I'm finally glad people that need to be looking at it are looking at it. So I thought a lot about retweeting that and what to tweet. And I think I even might have sent it out saying, if this is true, one of those, because that, and I said, and I did say, I checked two sources. I think it was, yeah, two sources, I think, that I felt were good sources. I found more, but I really needed to go with sources that I trust. So that's why I retweeted. But it's super easy to retweet or to share a post on Facebook without thinking about it. I saw one today. Somebody posted something where they were listing just a bunch of assertions. And I said, this is, and, and the source was crap. It was just another group. And I thought, there's no facts in here. There's no sources of um, where these, these comments are coming from. And there's certainly nothing to support them. There's nothing to prove that they're accurate. And I've just been like, nope, not anymore. And I'm shocked now when I look at my Facebook feed, how much I'm noticing that. But the, I think the last thing is, is that, and, and you'll see this in the social dilemma, and I think it's a place we need to aspire to, is that we have forgotten to think the best of people. So we're so quick to want to catch people in a lie or catch people making a mistake or whatever. We don't assume their intentions are good. And, I, and for me, if I use that as the mindset going out, then, then if I just choose to comment on somebody's post that I don't agree with, I assume still that they want the best for humanity, that they are trying to do their very best. So I don't come at them like some kind of club. I take my time and I appreciate that their intentions were good. Not everybody's intentions are good. I'm not that naive. I get it. A lot of people's intentions are cr crappy. But in general, I think a lot of people's intentions are good. So I encourage you to assume or, or, or to expect the best of people and then ignore the ones who that you think are not putting out good energy because that's never going to help any of us. We, we, good energy is, is super important for all of us to move forward. Like that's Jen the coach now, right? Let's look at our energy and figure out how we put out good positive energy. We live with awareness and we live with intention. So, okay, that went way longer than I thought, but I think it's such an interesting topic, and I w look forward to hearing your reviews of the movie and your discomfort with it on wherever it comes from. I'd love to know more about that. And next up, you are going to hear from Gay Hardwick. Thank you so much for turning in Season 3 Post-Conviction Edition of The Lawyer's Daughter. I will talk to you next time.